This uh, book, um, The System's View of Life, is uh, for me uh, the realization of a dream that I had for a very long time. It is a multidisciplinary textbook in which uh, my co-author and I, I wrote it with a friend of mine uh, and colleague, uh, Pierluigi Luisi, who is a professor of biology in Rome. And in this book, we present a coherent systemic framework which integrates four dimensions of life. The biological dimension, but also the cognitive dimension, the social and the ecological dimension. And we discuss the philosophical, social and political implications of this unifying vision. Let me start with some of these implications. The great challenge of our time and one of the main themes of all the courses at Schumacher College is to build and nurture sustainable communities. And what is sustained in a sustainable community is not um, economic growth or competitive advantage or any of these things that are sometimes emphasized. What is sustained is the very web of life on which our long-term survival depends. In other, in other words, a sustainable community uh, must be designed in such a way that its ways of life, its um, technology, technologies, physical structures, social institutions, and so on, uh, do not interfere with nature's inherent ability to sustain life. So this is the critical point. Nature has an inherent ability to sustain life. It has sustained life for billions of years, and we must not interfere with that. Now, in order to do that, we need, of course, to understand first how does nature sustain life. And it turns out that this involves a whole new conception of life. And indeed, such a new conception of life has emerged in science in the last 30 years or so. And this is what uh, Luisi and I call the system's view of life. At the forefront of contemporary science, the universe is no longer seen as a machine consisting of various basic building blocks, but rather is perceived as a network of inseparable relationships. That was the main breakthrough in quantum physics at uh, the beginning of the 20th century, this perceptual shift from objects to relationships. We've also discovered that uh, the planet as a whole is a living, self-regulating system. And I'm sure many of you have heard Stefan Harding speak about this, about the Gaia theory. The view of the human body as a machine and of the mind as a separate entity is now being replaced by one that sees not only the brain, but also the immune system, uh, and every, the tissues of the body, and in fact, every single cell as a living cognitive system. Evolution is no longer seen as a competitive struggle uh, for existence, but rather as a cooperative dance in which creativity and the constant emergence of novelty are the driving forces. And with the new emphasis on complexity, networks, patterns of organizations, a new science of qualities is now slowly emerging. So this is just in a nutshell what the system's view of life looks like. And we call this new science the system's view of life because it involves a new kind of thinking, thinking in terms of relationships, of patterns, of context. 
And in science, this way of thinking is called systemic thinking or systems thinking. It emerged in the 1920s and 1930s from a series of interdisciplinary dialogues involving biologists, psychologists, and ecologists. And in all these fields, scientists realized that a living system, an organism, an ecosystem, or a social system, is an integrated whole whose properties cannot be reduced to the properties of its parts. These systemic properties are properties of the whole that none of its parts have. So systems thinking involves a shift of perception from the parts to the whole. And the early systems thinkers expressed this uh, in the phrase, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Actually, in our book, we say that they coined this phrase. And I learned, unfortunately, after the book was finished and published, that this actually goes back to Aristotle. You, you can find this phrase, the whole is more than the sum of its parts in, in Aristotle. So hopefully there'll be a second edition of the book and I will put that in then. Now, systems theory also tells us that all living systems share a set of common properties and principles of organization. And this means that systems thinking can be applied to integrate academic disciplines that have become so fragmented, as you well know, and to show similarities between systems at different levels. And this is why we call the systems view of life a unifying vision. Now, during the 1970s and 1980s, systems thinking was raised to a new level of, uh, with the development of complexity theory, technically known as nonlinear dynamics. This is a new mathematics that includes chaos theory, fractals, and so on, which uh, allowed scientists for the first time to uh, really model uh, the complexity of living systems. And uh, this uh, new uh, mathematics is a mathematics of patterns of relationships. So this uh, shows us this shift from quantities to qualities. Now, during the last uh, 30 years or so, the strong interest in nonlinear phenomena has given rise to a whole series of new and powerful theories and models that have dramatically increased our understanding of many of the key characteristics of life. And so our synthesis of these theories and models is uh, what we call the systems view of life. Now, here, of course, tonight, I can give you only a few highlights. One of the most important insights of the systemic understanding of life is the recognition that networks are the basic pattern of organization of all living systems. Ecosystems, as you know, are understood in terms of food webs, that is, networks of organisms. Organisms are networks of organs, tissues, and cells, and cells are networks of molecules. And then we have social networks that are networks of communications. So wherever we see life, we see networks. The network is a pattern that is common to all life. And indeed, at the very heart of the change of paradigms that is now occurring in science and in society, we find a fundamental change of metaphors from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as a network. Now, these living networks have been studied very closely over the last 30 years. And these studies have shown that their key characteristic is that they are self-generating. Technically, this is known as the theory of autopoiesis, which was um, developed in the 1970s and 1980s uh, 
by two Chilean scientists, Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. Auto, of course, means self, and poiesis is derived from the Greek word poin, which means to make. So autopoiesis means self-making. In a cell, for example, all the biological structures like proteins and membranes, DNA, RNA, all these so-called macromolecules are uh, generated, are produced, and are regenerated constantly by the cellular network. Similarly, at the level of multicellular organisms, uh, an organism's cells are, com are continually recycled and uh, regenerated uh, by the organism's metabolic network. So living networks continually create or recreate themselves by transforming or replacing their components. And in this way, they undergo continual structural changes while at the same time preserving their web-like pattern of organization. And indeed, the coexistence of stability and change has long been observed as one of the key characteristics of life. Now, let me now come to one of the most important philosophical implications of the new system's view of life, and that is a novel concept of mind and consciousness, which finally overcomes the Cartesian division between mind and matter that has haunted uh, philosophers and scientists for centuries. If you uh, remember, uh, Descartes uh, divided the world into two uh, separate realms in a fundamental division between the mind, which he called the res cogitans, the thinking thing, and matter, which he called the extended thing, the res extensa. And following Descartes, scientists and philosophers for centuries continued to think of the mind as a thing. And they were wondering how this intangible entity uh, was related to that other thing, the body. The decisive advance of the system's view of life has been to abandon this Cartesian view of mind as a thing and to realize that mind and consciousness are not things but processes. This novel conception was developed during the 1960s by Gregory Bateson and independently by Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela both working at the University of Chile in Santiago, and it is known today as the Santiago theory of cognition, cognition being the process of knowledge. So instead of uh, speaking of mind, it is more accurate to speak of the process of cognition. And during the past three decades, the study of mind and consciousness from this perspective has uh, developed into uh, a very rich field, a multidisciplinary field known as cognitive science, which transcends the traditional frameworks of biology, neuroscience, psychology, epistemology, and so on. Now, the central insight of the Santiago theory is the identification of cognition, the process of knowing, with the process of life. Cognition, according to Maturana and Varela, is the activity involved in the self-generation and self-perpetuation of living networks. So the process of self-organization, which is the very process of life, is seen as a cognitive process. And correspondingly, the interactions of a living organism, plant, animal, or human, with its environment are cognitive interactions. And in this way, life and cognition are inseparably connected. Mind, or more accurately, mental activity, is immanent in matter at all levels of life. Now, this is a radical expansion of the concept of cognition, 
and implicitly the concept of mind. And if you hear this for the first time, I don't expect you to absorb it, accept it, and understand it right away. This is real novelty. Today, in our course at Schumacher College, we spent about an hour and a half discussing this. And so these are really very new concept. In this view, cognition involves the entire process of life, including perception, emotions, behavior, and does not even necessarily require a brain and a nervous system. So cognition, the process of knowledge, uh, is present at all levels of life. Now, of course, to, to have such a new concept could just be a change of language, and you have to see whether it actually helps you to understand things. And an easy way to see it is to uh, look at the uh, age-old uh, problem of the relationship between mind and brain. Uh, scientists and philosophers have known, uh, at least since the 19th century, that uh, mental processes are closely linked to neurophysiological processes, but um, they uh, were still puzzled about the exact relationship by, between mind and brain. Well, in the Santiago theory, this relationship is simple and very clear. The Cartesian characterization of mind as a thing is abandoned. Mind is a process, the process of cognition, which is identified with the process of life. And the brain is a specific structure through which this process operates. So the relationship between mind and brain is one between process and structure. Furthermore, the brain is not the only structure through which the process of cognition operates. The entire structure of the organism participates in the process of cognition, whether or not the organism has a brain and a higher nervous system. And parts of organisms that are also living systems have this cognitive process. And this is, for example, why we can speak of muscle memory and things like that, because a muscle is a living system and involved in cognitive activity. So this Santiago theory of cognition is the first scientific theory that really overcomes this Cartesian split between mind and matter. Mind and matter no longer appear to belong to separate categories, but can be seen as representing two complementary aspects of life, uh, process and structure. So at all levels of life, mind and matter, process and structure are inseparably connected. Now, cognition as understood in the Santiago theory is associated with all levels of life and is therefore a much broader phenomenon than consciousness. So in this theory, we have to distinguish between cognition and consciousness. Consciousness, that is conscious lived experience that involves self-awareness, not just awareness of the environment, but self-awareness, unfolds at a certain level of cognitive complexity that requires a brain and a higher nervous system. So consciousness is a special kind of cognitive process that emerges when cognition reaches a certain level of complexity. In evolution, it emerged about uh, four billion years ago with the great apes, and it may be present in some other mammals. We, we are not sure, maybe in whales, maybe in dolphins, and it fully unfolds then in uh, the human species. And as I said, the central characteristic of this special cognitive process is self-awareness. So I don't have time to go into details of recent theories of consciousness within that framework, but in the book we review several of them. Let me now come to another big topic in biology and in the life sciences, and that is evolution. Uh, one of the most rewarding features of the system's view of life is a new understanding of evolution. Rather than seeing evolution 
as the result of only random mutations followed by natural selection, we are beginning to recognize the creative unfolding of life in forms of ever-increasing complexity as an inherent characteristic of all living systems. Although uh, mutations and natural selection are still important and acknowledged, uh, the central focus is on creativity, on life's constant reaching out into novelty. We dedicate three chapters of our book to the system's view of evolution, and we begin with an homage to Charles Darwin. At the center of Darwinian thought stands the insight that all living organisms are related by common ancestry. All forms of life have descended from a common ancestor by a long process of modifications over billions of years. With this realization, Darwin's conception of life was utterly holistic and systemic. A vast planetary network of living beings interlinked in space and time. Now, as you know, the theory says that in the long evolutionary process, many more variations are produced than can possibly survive, and in this way, many individual species are weeded out by natural selection as some variants outgrow and outperform others. These basic ideas are well documented today, and all serious scientists are in complete agreement with them. The differences between the classical Darwinian and neo-Darwinian theory of evolution and the system's view is, uh, concerns the question of the dynamics of evolution, of the mechanisms through which evolutionary changes take place. To begin with, the system's view recognizes that evolution did not begin with the first living cell, but millions of years earlier with a process known as molecular or prebiotic evolution. Our detailed ideas about this prebiotic evolution of little protocells without DNA, without proteins, but self-organizing and self-perpetuating. So our details, detailed ideas about how this happened are still very speculative. But most biologists and biochemists today do not doubt that the origin of life on Earth was the result of a sequence of chemical events subject to the laws of physics and chemistry and to the nonlinear dynamics of complex systems. Now, my co-author, Pierluigi Luisi, is one of the world leaders in this research, and so he included a very detailed chapter uh, about the origin of life on Earth, this very intriguing new field of science. Well, as far as biological evolution is concerned, the classical view maintains that all evolutionary variation results from random mutations followed by natural selection. The systems view, by contrast, recognizes three avenues of evolution. Random mutations is the first one, but then uh, bacteria can transfer genes horizontally. They can eject genes and ingest genes, and actually they do so on a regular basis, day-to-day -day basis. And this is a very powerful way of uh, exchanging um, you know, in inheritable uh, traits. The, the great microbiologist Lynn Margulis expressed this in the following way. Uh, horizontal gene transfer, she wrote, is it's as if you jumped into a pool with brown eyes and came out on the other end with blue eyes. So this is this constant exchange of genes among bacteria. And finally, the, uh, the third um, avenue of evolution is something that Lynn Margulis discovered and developed. It's called symbiogenesis. That means the creation of new biological forms through symbiosis 
of organisms living within other organisms and becoming ever more closely associated until they form a new species, a new organisms. Now, in all these processes, there are random elements, so chance plays a role, or contingency, as evolutionary theorists prefer to say. So chance plays a role, but um, once the, uh, the new genome has arisen out of these various processes, it needs to be integrated within the cellular environment, within the genetic environment and the cellular environment. And through, uh, in, in this integration, there are severe constraints and only a limited number of new forms and functions are possible. And that's how natural selection works. And what I want to emphasize is that this entire process of integration is far from random. It is complex and highly ordered. So randomness plays only a small role in evolution. According to the systems view, the expression of life's creativity in the process of evolution must be seen as an aspect of a much broader process of life. And since this process of life is closely associated with cognition, evolution is a process that is complex, highly ordered, and ultimately cognitive. So it's an integral part of life's self-organization. Well, let me rush on to another field of the system's view of life. Let's leave biology behind now and move into the social domain. There, the key concept again is the network. And as you well know, social networks are not networks of chemical reactions, but are networks of communications. This has been developed into a theory of uh, that is called social autopoiesis by the German socio sociologist Niklas Luhmann. And uh, according to Luhmann, uh, social networks like biological networks are self-generating, but what they generate is mostly non-material. So each communication generates thoughts and meaning which give rise to further communications, and so the entire network generates itself. And as communications continue in a social network, they form multiple feedback loops, which eventually produce a shared system of beliefs, explanations, and values, and this is what is known as culture. This is actually a very, to me, a very fascinating dynamic, the dynamic of culture, because you have a network of communications, or a community, if you wish, and this network generates a shared uh, set of beliefs, values, and so on, a shared culture. And through this culture, the individuals become members of the community, and they show their membership by behaving in a certain way. This is why we behave differently when we are in different communities. In other words, the community imposes restrictions on the behavior of its members. But these restrictions are generated by the members themselves. So it's a very interesting dynamic. <clears throat> well, moving right along, in the fourth and last part of our book, um, which is titled Sustaining the Web of Life, we discuss the critical importance of the system's view of life for dealing with the problems of our multifaceted global crisis. It is now becoming ever more evident that the major problems of our time, energy, environment, climate change, poverty, and so on, cannot be understood in isolation. Each one of these problems is a systemic problems, problem, which means that they're all interconnected and interdependent. So the system's view of life is really essential 
to deal with the major problems we have. The fundamental dilemma underlying all these problems seems to be the illusion that unlimited growth is possible on a finite planet. This irrational belief in perpetual economic growth amounts to a clash between linear thinking projecting outward linearly into the future and the non-linear patterns in our biosphere, the ecological networks and cycles that constitute the web of life. This highly non-linear global network contains countless feedback loops through which the planet balances and regulates itself. This is the very essence of Gaia theory to study these feedback loops. Our current economic system, by contrast, is fueled by materialism and greed that do not seem to recognize any limits. As you know, economic and corporate growth are the driving forces of global capitalism, the dominant economic system today. At the center of the global economy, economy is a network of financial flows which has been designed without any ethical framework. In fact, social inequality and social exclusion are inherent features of economic globalization, widening the gap between the rich and the poor and increasing world poverty. And in this economic system, Perpetual growth is pursued relentlessly by promoting excessive consumption and a throwaway economy that is energy and resource intensive, generating waste and pollution and depleting the Earth's natural resources. Moreover, these environmental problems are exacerbated by global, cl global climate change, itself a consequence of our energy intensive and fuel, fossil fuel-based technologies. So it seems that our key challenge is how to shift from an economic system based on the notion of unlimited growth to one that is both ecologically sustainable and socially just. Now, there are some people and groups that advocate no growth or negative growth, things like that, but in my view, this is not a solution because growth is a central characteristic of all life. A society or economy being a living system uh, will die if it does not grow. However, growth in nature is not linear nor is it unlimited. While certain parts of organisms or ecosystems grow, others decline uh, and they, then they disintegrate it and in doing so release their components which are recycled and become uh, resources for new growth. Now this kind of balanced, multifaceted growth is well known to biologists and ecologists. We call it in our book qualitative growth to contrast it with the concept of quantitative growth used by economists and politicians and measured in a very crude quantitative index, the gross domestic product or GDP. In fact, most of what is called growth today is waste because it's a growth of products that are produced to keep the economy going but we don't really need them and then they are thrown away and so uh, we have today an economy of largely waste and destruction. Qualitative growth, by contrast, is growth that enhances the quality of life through generation and regeneration. In living organisms, ecosystems and societies, qualitative growth includes an increase of complexity, of maturity, of sophistication. Now, this focus on qualitative growth is fully consistent with the new scientific conception of life, which, as I have mentioned, is a science of qualities. The qualities of a complex system are properties of the system 
that none of its parts exhibit. Quantities tell us about the properties of the parts. For example, a quantity like the mass of a system. You can divide it up into the parts and weigh each part and the total weight or mass uh, is then the mass of, of the whole system. Uh, qualities, by contrast, for instance, uh, health or stress, cannot be expressed as the sum properties of the parts. If I am healthy, it's not because my fingers are healthy and my legs are healthy and, and you know, my heart is healthy and I add all that up and that's my total health. Health derives from the relationships between those parts, from the processes, from a certain balance and harmony in these processes. And so the same uh, applies to the economy. We cannot understand the nature of complex systems, whether they be organisms, ecosystems, or economies, if we try to describe them in purely quantitative terms. Quantities can be measured, qualities need to be mapped. And so what we need to assess the health of an economy are qualitative indicators, indicators of poverty, health, equity, education, uh, and ecological balance, and so on. And none of them can be reduced to monetary coefficients nor aggregated into a simple number. So instead of assessing the state of the economy in terms of the crude quantitative measure of GDP, we need to distinguish between good growth and bad growth. And this distinction from an ecological point of view is easy to make. Uh, bad growth is growth that uh, depletes natural resources, involves toxic products, emits greenhouse gases and so on. Good growth is the opposite, renewable resources, uh, no, no toxic uh, chemicals uh, and, you know, efficient production, recycling and so on. And so what we need to do is to increase uh, the good growth at, at the expense of the bad growth so that human and natural resources tied up in wasteful and unsound production processes can be freed and recycled for efficient and sustainable processes. So now to conclude, I would like to return to the concept of ecological sustainability. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, a sustainable human community is designed in such a manner that its ways of life do not interfere with nature's inherent ability to sustain life. And uh, the first step toward a sustainable future must be to understand the principles of organization that the Earth's ecosystems have evolved to sustain the web of life. This knowledge of the basic principles of ecology, in other words, of the ecological dimension of the system's view of life, is what is known today as ecological literacy or eco-literacy. Becoming eco-literate is the first step on the road toward sustainability. The second step is eco-design. That means applying our ecological knowledge to the fundamental redesign of our technologies and social institutions so as to bridge the current gap between human design and the ecologically sustainable systems of nature. To practice design in such a context requires a fundamental shift of our attitude toward nature, from trying to see what we can extract from nature to trying to see what we can learn from her. It's a really fundamental shift. And as you know, there, have been, uh, there has been a dramatic rise in ecologically oriented design projects and uh, projects um, and processes in recent years. In our book, we review these practices in some detail and in particular, we discuss three different but mutually compatible strategies for designing an economy without any fossil fuels and for achieving this goal 
by 2050. Uh, the names of these strategies, which are also the titles of the books of their authors, are Plan B by Lester Brown, Reinventing Fire by Amory Lovins, and The Third Industrial Revolution by Jeremy Rifkin. These are three roadmaps for going beyond fossil fuels, and they all involve systemic thinking and eco-design solutions, which means that they solve not only the urgent problem of climate change, but also many of our other global problems, the degradation of the environment, food insecurity, poverty, unemployment, and others. Together, these systemic solutions present compelling evidence that ecological literacy and the system's view of life have given us the knowledge and the technology to build a sustainable future. What we need now is political will and leadership. And with that, I thank you for your attention.